Good evening, aspirants. Welcome to daily editorial analysis of Shankar AS Academy. Today's date is 7th November 2024. These are the three important articles we are going to discuss today. The first article is about UP Madrasa Act. The second article is about the Trump's re election and what it means for India. The third article is about the huge pollution in Yamuna River. So, these are the three articles we are going to discuss in this video. Shankar AS Academy's pre storming prelims to series batch 3. Is starting on 21st November 2024. Interested aspirants can enroll on this test series. Now let us get into the discussion. Look at this news article. Delhi High Court dismissed the rituals along the banks of Emuna River. It said that it could not allow rituals because it may harm the devotees because of the highly polluted river. So, what are the reasons for the high pollution in Emuna River? What are the basics of this river? Let us discuss in this news article discussion. Firstly, let us start with the basics of Yamuna River. So, Yamuna River is a major tributary of Ganges. This Yamuna River originates from Yamunotri Glacier, which is present near Bandarpunj Peak in Musauri Range. This Musauri Range is part of lower range of Himalayas. And this Musauri Range is located in Uttarkashi District in Uttarkhand. From this Uttarkashi District, located the Bandarpunj Peak, and from this peak only, the Yamuna River originates particularly from the Yamuna 3 glacier. So, this is about the origin of river Yamuna. After flowing through Uttarkhand, Himachal Pradesh, Haryana and Delhi, Yamuna meets the Ganges river at Prayagraj in Uttar Pradesh. It flows for about 1376 km. So, these are the important dams located on Yamuna river. Lakwar Vyasi Dam, it is in Uttarkhand and Tajaywala Barrage Dam in Haryana. Now, look at this map. These are the important tributaries of river Yamuna. Chambal, Betwa, Ken, Tons, Hinden, etc. Now, what are the causes for huge pollution in Yamuna River? The important thing is domestic wastewater, which is flooded into Yamuna River. Then, industrial effluents and immersion of idols during rituals, pesticide residue from agriculture, untreated sewages. This causes a rise in ammonia level and this leads to huge pollution in Yamuna River. So, these are the important factors that lead to pollution of Yamuna River. Now, let us discuss some important cases regarding Yamuna River pollution. In 1994, Supreme Court summoned the Central Pollution Control Board to address the gaps in cleaning the Yamuna River. It involved Delhi, Uttar Pradesh and Haryana governments. The National Green Tribunal in 2015 initiated a program called Meiles Nirmal Yamuna Revitalization Plan 2017. And this plan is aimed at cleaning the river by 2017 and it was not fully achieved. The National Capital Region Regional Plan 2041. See, the NCR Planning Board set a revised target of 2026 to achieve the zero discharge of untreated sewage and industrial waste into Yamuna. The National Green Tribunal directed Delhi and Haryana government to identify and mitigate the pollution sources for the river. The Delhi Jal Board is responsible for managing the entire river ecosystem and it has specific attention to reduce the pollution within the Delhi stretch of Yamuna. The Delhi government also issued a six-point action plan for Yamuna cleanup. In order to clean the Yamuna River, which is aimed at making Delhi a clean, beautiful and modern city, Delhi government launched this six-point action plan. So, this six-point action plan includes expanding the sewer connectivity to 100% of households under Chief Minister Free Sewer Connection Scheme. So, these are some of the important steps taken by Delhi government to clean up the river Yamuna. So, this is all about the discussion. Now, let us move on to the next news article. Now, look at this article. Donald Trump's return as US president could bring India and US closer together. In terms of ties like trade, defense and reduced scrutiny on internal issues, it aligns with Prime Minister Modi's interest. However, there may be many challenges which arise from Trump's unpredictability in diplomacy and trade tariffs. So, in this context, let us discuss what are the opportunities and challenges with Trump re-elected as US president. First, let us discuss the opportunities for India. Regarding the trade and economic growth, Trump may reopen discussions on free trade agreement, that is FTA, which potentially boosts the bilateral trade volume and it stood at 146 billion in 2022. The encouragement of Indian investment in US energy and strengthening of India's energy security, this is in terms of energy cooperation. Regarding defense and strategic partnership, Trump could support increased arms sales and tech transfer for defense, which aligns with India's defense diversification goals. With the Trump focus on countering China, India may see greater US support for joint military exercises and intelligence sharing initiatives. Trump may continue a tough stance on aid to Pakistan, which address India's concerns about cross-border terrorism. The Trump's administration could align with India's security interest by opposing Khalistani separatist movement. So, these are the some of important opportunities which can be foreseen in Trump's second presidency. 
Now let us discuss some challenges that may happen due to Trump's re-election. First about the trade protectionism. See, Trump's preference for higher tariffs could hurt India's exports. In the past, he withdrew from India's GSP status, which impacted various sectors in India. Then America first policies. See, pressures on India to lower tariffs could impact industries such as agriculture and information technology in India. So, trade protectionism is one of the challenges which we must face. The second one is restrictive immigration policies. The concerns regarding H-1B visa. Trump's immigration stance might lead to stricter visa policies. So, this might affect India's professionals in US, especially in the tech sector. Next about unpredictable diplomacy. See, Trump is known for unpredictable diplomatic actions. He could unexpectedly share sensitive information or make statements that could impact Indo-US ties. So, this is seen in his previous remarks on Kashmir and India-China border issues. Then lastly about the reduced focus on climate and environmental cooperation. As we know, Trump has limited interest in climate initiatives which may complicate India's climate commitments and cooperation under Paris Agreement. So, these are some of the challenges that we may face in his second presidency. Regardless of these opportunities and challenges, India should engage with various US stakeholders beyond the presidency like Congress, state governments, think tanks to ensure the policy continuity. India should continue to develop a network of defense partners which can reduce the reliance on single source and it can strengthen the self-reliance. India should prioritize the technology sharing over direct purchases. So, this could enhance India's defense manufacturing capabilities. India should also enhance the quad and regional ties. India can leverage the Trump's Indo-Pacific vision by deepening the quad cooperation. So, India can benefit from this and as a leader of Indo-Pacific region. India should proactively address US trade concern to protect the key sectors like IT and pharmaceuticals. We should also advocate for favorable immigration policies to protect our diaspora and workforce in the US. While Trump 2.0 could bring economic defense and strategic opportunities, there are many challenges that still remain. Challenges regarding trade dispute, immigration policies and unpredictable diplomacy. A balanced approach leveraging the strategic alignments especially in defense and Indo-Pacific and also maintaining the flexibility and diversification is crucial for India. This can strengthen India's relationship with the US. So, with this, let us conclude the discussion. This is a main question regarding this topic. Interested aspirants can use it. Now, look at this article. It discusses a recent Supreme Court ruling regarding Uttar Pradesh Board of Madrasa Education Act 2004. On November 5, 2024, Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of this act. So, this overturned a previous decision by Allahabad High Court. So, previously Allahabad High Court has deemed the act in conflict with secular principles. But now, the Supreme Court has upheld the constitutionality of this act. Now, let us discuss about this act in this discussion. Supreme Court found that the provisions in 2004 act allowed madrasas to grant higher education degrees like Kamil which is an undergraduate degree and Fazil which is a postgraduate degree. So, these undergraduate and postgraduate degrees which are granted by madrasas violated the University Grants Commission Act of 1956. So, the court ruled that only institutions which are regulated by UGC should be allowed to issue such degrees. The Supreme Court emphasized that while madrasas are religious institutions, they should also provide a secular education as a part of their curriculum. This is in order to align with the state education standards. So, this ensures students to receive a balanced education that respects a religious background while meeting a broader educational requirements. So, there should be also about the secular education in madrasas. So, this is what Supreme Court has said. The court also stated that the state has the right to regulate madrasas to ensure quality education. This is even when the religious instruction is part of the curriculum. So, there can be religious instruction and there should also be a secular education inside madrasas. So, this regulation must respect the autonomy of minority institutions and should not overstep the constitutional bounds. So, this is what the Supreme Court have said. The Uttar Pradesh Board of Madrasa Education Act 2004. This law is established to regulate madrasas in the state of Uttar Pradesh and this act set up Uttar Pradesh Board of Madrasa Education. So, this board has the authority to oversee and standardize the curriculum and administration of madrasas within Uttar Pradesh. Regarding the establishment of board, this Uttar Pradesh Board of Madrasa Education was established under this act. The board's role includes setting curriculum standards, organizing examination and providing guidelines on administrative and educational matters. This Madrasa Education Act 2004 also mandates that madrasas should incorporate secular education along with the religious studies. So, this will promote a well-rounded curriculum 
that include subjects like science, mathematics, social studies along with traditional Islamic subjects. So, this dual approach aims to equip the students with both religious knowledge and modern secular education. Now, regarding the granting of degrees, originally the act allowed madrasas to award degrees at various levels like Kamil degree which is an undergraduate degree and Fasil which is a postgraduate degree. So, these degrees were intended to have recognition similar to those normal universities. However, the recent Supreme Court ruling found this provision unconstitutional because it is a violation against the University Grants Commission. So, this means the madrasas in Uttar Pradesh can no longer issue the Kamil and Fasil degrees. So, degrees can only be issued by universities which function under UGC. Regarding the recognition and funding, see madrasas that follow the standards which are set by the madrasa board can be recognized by the state and make them eligible for government funding and support. So, the state funding can assist in improving the facilities, hiring qualified teachers for madrasas. Then about the regulation and autonomy. While the Madrasa Act 2004 regulates the educational standards in madrasas, it also respects the minority status of these institutions. So, this means that they can retain their degree of autonomy, particularly in teaching the religious subjects, as long as they adhere to the state prescribed standards. So, the Madrasa Act 2004 aims to balance the religious instruction with the state educational standards. So, this is all about the Madrasa Act of 2004, which is recently in news. Now, let us discuss some basic information about University Grants Commission Act. The UGC Act of 1956 established University Grants Commission as India's apex body to regulate and maintain the higher education standards. So, it is operating under Ministry of Education and UGC is empowered to set educational standards and conduct inspection. It can allocate funds and advise the government on education policy. The important provisions of this University Grants Commission Act includes degree recognition. Only UGC recognized universities can grant degrees. It also prohibits unrecognized universities. It can inspect institutions to ensure the compliance with the standards. It also has funding eligibility, which means only UGC approved institutions can receive the central government's funding. Regarding the setting of standards, UGC regulates the curriculum, faculty qualification, and student assessment. So, UGC basically sets the standard for which the qualifications of universities and also for the students. Now, what is the impact of the recent Supreme Court ruling on Madrasa Act of 2004? See, the Supreme Court recent decision upheld the constitutionality of the Act. This highlights a need for balance between the autonomous of religious institutions and adherence to the national education standards. So, this ruling could lead to adjustment in how Madrasa structure their programs if they seek official recognition and funding. So, this is all about the discussion. This is the main question related to this topic. Interested aspirants can use it. If you like the video, please share it with your friends and don't forget to subscribe to Shankaraya's Academy YouTube channel. Thank you for watching.